today with great Anthony Pope, a renowned <laughs> attorney. Uh, I'm going to jump right into it. I mean, you've been in the mix for a really long time. Uh, you're not shy of going on things like Dr. Phil. You commented on, on things like uh, the Michael Jackson trial, uh, the death of Michael Jackson. And celebrities are a huge part of everyday life for everybody. And as an attorney, I'm sure that you see a ton of the things that celebrities find themselves in, issues, debacles, and whatnot. Uh, recently, we've seen someone like Justin Bieber in the media, again, for another DUI. Why is it celebrities uh, seem to, for the normal folk, get away uh, from any legal issues when it comes to their situations and whatnot? Is it because they're role models? I think it's more because they can afford uh, good lawyers. Mm. You know, there's an old saying that how much justice can you afford? Now, let's be, let's be frank about it. I mean, if somebody goes out there and really commits a violent crime or a serious offense, uh, more than likely a jury's going to have to make a decision on it and they'll go to jail if they're found guilty. So you can hire all the lawyers in the world. At some point, if the evidence is overwhelming against you and the offense that you have committed or alleged to have committed is serious enough, you're going to pay a price like anyone else. When you have these incidents where people like Justin Bieber, they get involved with DWIs or small <laughs> matters, they hire lawyers, lawyers protract it out for a while, they hire doctors to examine them, they talk about their, their mental state, they talk about their overwhelming stress that they have as celebrities, and they prolong things to a point where they try to get an alternative remedy for something other than jail. Because typically they're minor offenses. Uh, so is it really something where they're being treated differently? It's really a matter that they have the, the money and the wherewithal to really prolong things, get the best doctors, get the best lawyers, and utilize the system to its fullest. And that's really what they do for the most part. Uh, they're calling it the Fappening, Celebgate. Uh, it seemed like hackers went through and took out iCloud and they took out the private and naked and nude images of celebrities. Now, this is turning into a, a huge situation of where does accountability lie as far as the people who view it, people who share it, and the person who actually did it? Well, look, you know, my sense of it is this. The, the Internet uh, has caused us to have less privacy. And it's a reality. You know, it's sort of, you know, after 9-11, a lot of our rights were lost. There's no doubt. When the Patriot Act took over, our, our ability to get on a plane without being frisked and without being going through monitors, our ability to transfer money from one bank account to another changed. A whole host of things changed. Why? Because we were attacked by another country and we had to now protect our interests. And there's a reality to that. So you have to accept it at some level. And you have to balance it. With celebrities, they, I, I get a sense that they like the entitlements that they get mm -hmm. as being celebrities, but they don't, like the, they don't like the problems that are associated with it, i.e. that their privacy is going to be invaded upon at different times. The question here is, why in the world, as a celebrity, would you put nude photos on the, on the Internet or send them to somebody, knowing how easy it is to get into that? So, you know, you have to have some accountability for yourself as well. When I talk on a phone, I assume somebody else is listening. If I send a text message, I, it's something that I'm going to send that I would not be embarrassed for someone else to read. If I send a picture, I'm assuming that, number one, I, once I send it out there, it's no longer mine because I sent it out and the person I'm sending it to could share it with someone else if they chose to. So there, there's a sense of responsibility that we also have to take for ourselves, recognizing the society in which we're living. There's benefits that come with it, and then there's, there's a downside to it as well. So do I feel bad for them? Not necessarily. I, I think it's somewhat silly to send out naked pictures on the Internet, right? never thinking that somebody else is going to share it with someone else. There is a limit to it. Certainly, you can't go into someone's property, on someone's property, and take photographs in their home or when they're doing certain things of that nature. But when you're on the street, when you're sending photographs through the Internet or a text message, you have to expect at some point somebody could possibly get their hands on them. Speaking of Hollywood, I mean, looking through your office, I see a lot of pictures of old Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And especially in your hallway, I saw a picture of Gregory Peck in the great movie To Kill a Mockingbird, right. which was based on uh, interracial strife. Um, <coughs> not only so, your office is in Newark, which has been a huge uh, place where, uh, of a melting pot over the past 20, 30 years. Uh, 
And there has been a lot of strife here also over the past decade or so, and it's changed. Now, moving to Ferguson, uh, Missouri, which we've seen, uh, where do you see some of the accountability uh, lie in that situation? You know, or is it still too murky to talk about? Well, there, there's some, there's the only issue that I really see that is murky is the issue between the time that the decedent left the car, the police officer got out of the car, drew his weapon, and the decedent was shot. That area of time there is in question. And that's for a grand jury to decide, one, whether there's going to be an indictment, and then ultimately, if there is an indictment, for a trial jury to decide whether the police officer's actions were appropriate or not. What troubles me greatly about the Ferguson situation is that being born and raised in Newark and having friends of all colors and, and religions, we've always tried to integrate ourselves. And, and I thought our purpose was to integrate and to not segregate. And Ferguson troubles me because you have a young man. Now, whether he was shot appropriately or whether the actions were, were justified for the police officer is a decision for the court. But we do know that there was a police action that was being taken. We do know undisputed that the, uh, the, the young man had robbed the store. We do know without dispute that he attacked the police officer in the car and he went for his weapon and the police officer's eye socket was fractured. Now with that information, one would think that reasonable people would say the rule of law must apply. And the rule of law is that there's an investigation, there's a grand jury presentment, and there's a determination as to the conduct that occurred on both parties' behalf. What is it about this case that made it racial, other than the fact that one man's skin color was white and one man's skin color was black? I found no other racial component. It was not a profiling case. It wasn't a situation where there was an interaction where their words were exchanged, where someone could suggest that it was racial in nature. People's stores being shot up by people protesting in the street and destroying other people's businesses. How in the world does that facilitate or advance anyone's goal? I, I just don't get it. And, and I'm troubled by people that seem to have an agenda that unless they make something racial, they're not relevant. And, and I speak of somebody like Al Sharpton. Absolutely. I, I, I don't get his point of view. I mean, what is it that made this case racial? I don't understand it. Now, if you, could, if you juxtapose that case, for instance, with Trayvon Martin, that's a different case altogether. That was racial. Because that young man was, was haunted down like because he was black. No question about it. It's undisputed. Why he wasn't convicted, I have no idea. He should have been convicted of at least manslaughter, in Good my lawyers. opinion. Okay? Well, I don't know. I think it's just the jury is so skewed down there. Mm -hmm. Because everybody's allowed to carry a gun. I mean, it's the most insane thing in the world. And you have this other man, Zimmerman, who, who fashions himself a cop. He's not a cop. He was told by the police to stop following this guy. And I think what happened was there was a confrontation. The Trayvon was getting the better of him, and he shot him. And that's the long and short of it. And he should have been found guilty of something. But I see such a difference with the other case in Ferguson. Here, this is a law enforcement officer in a uniform. He's giving a lawful order to somebody. Now, something happened. If the cop was wrong and he overreacted, then he'll pay the price for it. But if he's not, then he won't. And what caused this to get so blown out of proportion? There's shootings every day. Do you realize that, for instance, why is it that the agitators are not in Chicago? Why is it that black men can be killed consistently, yet nobody goes to Chicago to protest that? Why is it that we get out black men killed in the streets of Newark but I never see those guys here. Why is that? Do you realize between the time of when the Iraq War started and when it ended, there were 4,200 American soldiers that were killed. In the state, in the same time period, you know how many black men were killed in Chicago? 5,000. And 99% of the black men that were killed were killed by other blacks. Now why is a black life worth less if it's taken by someone who's black? I, I, I don't get the point here. Isn't this about the saving lives? So where the hell are these people and why they're not in Chicago? Do you read the paper? People are being killed every day in our country by gangs. There are people that can't come out of their homes because there's drug dealers on the corner. 
And what they're worrying about is patting someone down for a gun. I mean, it's so skewed, it's so misplaced, the concern, and the only rationale I have for it is that people are not relevant unless they're alleging that we're adversaries, that a white man and a black man have to be an adversary for there to be newsworthy. That's just craziness. Speaking of skewed, um, it's coming out that a lot of the eyewitness reports in Ferguson were changed or, in a sense, skewed after the media got involved. and. It seems in retaliation, um, the police pushed away or they denied the media in Ferguson to come in, whether it was CNN, it was Credit, Al Jazeera, whatever the case may be. At what point was it lawful for law enforcement to, to do such a thing? I, I think that it was a mistake for law enforcement not to release information sooner. That's for sure. And the only thing I can, I can think of, and you know, I'm not trying to support the one way or the other because I don't know anything about them, uh, I know that the commander there is an African-American, state police commander, seems to be very much in charge of what was going on. Uh, but I think it was such a small community. And to be confronted with this enormous <laughs> type of situation, it was, it was uncharted waters for them. It's not like being in New York City or L.A. or even Newark, where these things happen more routinely, where there's a system that's put in place where you, you have a game plan, you know how to deal with it. I think Ferguson was just taken by surprise, and I just think they were amateurs at it.